give your personal time for the betterment of your community, that's a significant giving. Um, and time is the one thing you can never get back. So from the two of us personally, thank you for being here and thank you for being willing to come and share your thoughts about the Fall River Police Department. If you'll bear with me, I have a uh, scripted form I need to go through here, and it'll take me just a minute or two. Good evening, my name is Jackie Boykin. I'm a captain with the police department in Nightdale, North Carolina. I'm also the leader of the team that will be assessing the Fall River Police Department over the next several days. This is Joseph Race. He is a captain with the Madison Police Department in Connecticut. The Commission on Accreditation for Law Enforcement Agencies in Gainesville, Virginia has authorized us to assess the Fall River Police Department, which is a candidate for reaccreditation. The Fall River Police Department has voluntarily contracted with the Commission to work toward reaccreditation and thereby continue to demonstrate its professional excellence. When the agency originally entered this process, it received the Commission's Standards Manual, which contained 179 standards encompassing all facets of law enforcement management, operations, and support functions. The Commission accredited this agency in November 2009 after determining it had de demonstrated its compliance with all applicable standards. The agency's proofs of compliance are on file here at the Fall River Police Department. Since then, the agency has attempted to maintain those standards. Our responsibility as assessors, sorry, for the Commission is to revisit the agency and verify that it has remained in compliance since it was last accredited. Albert Dupier, the Chief of Police of the Fall River Police Department, has appointed Sergeant James T. Hoare <coughs> as the Accreditation Manager to oversee the accreditation process for this agency. In accordance with the Commission's public information policy, the agency's candidacy for reaccreditation has been publicized in this area and the agency has arranged for this public hearing. The public hearing is intended to provide interested citizens or employees of the agency an opportunity to address this assessment team concerning the agency. Any comments that you make will be considered by us as we review the agency and will also be reported back to the Commission. If you wish to supplement your verbal comments with a written statement or exhibits, you may present them to our team at the time you speak or you may send them to the Commission where they will be reviewed when the agency is presented for its reaccreditation at the formal Commission conference. You may mail your written remarks to the Commission in Gainesville, Virginia. At the beginning of the meeting, a sign-in sheet was made available in the rear of the room. Those of you who indicated a desire to speak will be given an opportunity to address us in a few moments. We ask that you limit your comments to five minutes. If you wish to speak with any member of the Commission staff, you can reach them at 703-352-4225. The Commission's staff representative for this agency is Paul McMillan. You may also email your comments to Kalia at Kalia.org, placing the agency's name in the subject line. I'd like to remind you that this meeting is being video recorded. Do you have any questions before we begin? All right, we'll get started with Ms. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Kathy Ann Viveras, and I have served as the city administrator for the city of Fall River since January of 2014. Um, so I've had uh, the personal pleasure of working uh, with the Fall River Police Department and most recently with Chief Alder Pierre. And so it's uh, a pleasure for me to be here this evening to speak in favor of. Um, the recertification of accreditation for the Fall River Police Department. Um, I'll address a couple of points. Uh, first and foremost, as a city administrator, finances are extremely important. Uh, they're typically limited, 
in larger urban communities such as Fall River. Uh, but I want to share with the accreditation team that Chief Dupair and his administrative staff have uh, done an excellent job at being uh, mindful of limited resources and yet <coughs> maximizing the department's ability um, to put uh, police forces on the street, working within our communities, within our schools, um, and I think that uh, their financial management has been a great asset to the community of Fall River and is much appreciated by the citizenry of the city of Fall River. Um, secondly, um, I know, and you mentioned in your opening remarks about the importance of policies and procedures and adherences to those things, um, but I've also been especially impressed with the fact that even though they strive um, to meet all of those requirements that come along with accreditation, they have not lost contact or lost what I like to refer to as the human touch. Uh, they work very closely within the community. I know we have neighborhood representatives here. Uh, they have a very strong and high profile within our school department and within all of our um, neighborhoods throughout the city. Our residents, our businesses, I think, have a very high degree of trust in their law enforcement officers, and that is a great um, tribute to them. Uh, they administer their duties in a very fair, honest, and equitable manner, uh, always professional, and the community acknowledges that and appreciates that, and I'm sure you're going to hear that later on this evening from the others who are going to testify. So on behalf of um, the City of Fall River, and specifically Mayor Correa, who I know you're going to be hearing from, um, I offer my full and complete um, endorsement of this reaccreditation. I think the department has worked very hard to earn that accreditation. They work very hard to maintain it, to maintain high professional standards every single day when they report. And we all know it's a very difficult and challenging profession that they've embarked upon but they do it admirably and again have earned the full respect of the citizenry of the city of Fall River. So we urge you uh, to afford them reaccreditation. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Let me uh, just start by saying Kathy went before me because she has to go to an ordinance meeting. I know. So I just want uh, everybody to know that otherwise I probably wouldn't take the but. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here this evening as well with so many wonderful community leaders. I see uh, colleagues in government, uh, different members of our community, school committee members, our fire chief as well as police chief, who are just two outstanding individuals. Uh, and what I'll do is I'll, I'll give a couple specific examples of some of the things that I think really stand out about this particular police department. Uh, first and foremost, the job is, as everybody knows in the, in the department, and I'm sure in other communities throughout the, com the Commonwealth and the country, uh, the job has become more difficult. Today's job being a police officer is not the same as 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. Uh, and these gentlemen and, and women in this department have really uh, risen above a lot of the different things that go, go on nationwide. I think that's really important. They've got an excellent relationship with the city, the city's youth, different diversities, different backgrounds, whether it's Cambodian, Spanish-speaking communities, the Portuguese-speaking community, Hispanic-speaking community, they really have uh, cultivated great relationships around diversity. And I think that's really important to today's modern uh, police department. So that's very important, number one. Number two, a nationwide issue that every community is addressing is the opiate crisis. Uh, this department, even though um, that probably sometimes bogs them down with different calls that they may have to go to, uh, again, they have risen to the challenge and really exceeded most people's expectations. Uh, and they've been recognized for that. One program in particular, which is a, a public-private partnership in a way, uh, because you've got private citizens that have come together to create a task force on the opiate crisis. Uh, they have also worked very closely with this department on something called the Project Reconnect. Really, I think it's one of the best programs that we have. Project Reconnect essentially connects a police officer during an overdose uh, with the person that's overdose. They're the first ones on the scene typically, even before EMS or EMTs arrive. So I think that program has done has been just incredible uh, for our community, and that's called Project Reconnect. So I think that's that's one to, to know. 
uh, speaking about the neighborhood associations, and I'm sure they'll say it later on today, but every time I attend a neighborhood association meeting, there's always a police officer there that comes in and gives a very honest and accurate report of what's happening in that neighborhood, real time, the night before, the same day if possible, and they also make themselves totally available, the officer makes themselves totally available to talk to anybody privately if they didn't feel comfortable sharing in front of the entire group at the neighborhood association meetings throughout all parts of our community. And I know that the neighborhood uh, individuals really, uh, really appreciate that. That's been something that they've really enjoyed having as they comment to me all the time about that. And we have some neighborhood presidents in the room that I'm sure will speak about that. In terms of uh, just community involvement, um, you've got Christian McCluskey here today. I'm sure he'll talk about the Police of Palooza and some of the other events that, that he does uh, in coordination with the, uh, the police department. And it's a great way to get families, kids, uh, young people, and adults uh, touching, feeling the different equipment that the department has, uh, and they do a great job making sure that families know that they're safe, and that they actually put a face and a name to our police officers. A lot of people in the community, whether it's in coffee shops, or whether it's at the park, or down the waterfront, they know police officers by name, which is really important. I mean, that you, don't, you don't see that in every community, but there are average citizens walking the street that know police officers by name. Uh, with Community Development Agency, I don't think there's a representative from our CDA office, but this department has an excellent relationship with community development and our federal dollars. Uh, we've been able to put a lot of officers on the street, uh, the street beats, also the bicycle officers as well, especially in a day like today, nice and hot out there. Uh, you know, so again, getting them into the community, getting them into the parks has been really important and they've welcomed that and we've been very creative. So I'll, I'll wrap up with just two more points. Uh, all those things take creativity. You know, they're not, they're not automatic. They're not the average things that every department does. Um, they don't even have to do some of those things, per se. But this department, I have to say, as the mayor of Fall River, uh, every time I ask, they're right there to help, no matter what it is. Uh, even if it's something like the Narcan program that was started a few years back, uh, where they all pretty much jumped on board with uh, providing citizens Narcan if they needed it, or whether it's getting creative with different initiatives that the city has, uh, this department gets creative and really rolls up their sleeves to help the city when it can. Um, and then lastly, you heard about, as I spoke, all the different partners, the Neighbor Association, Christian from Youth Services, the school department is represented here with the superintendent and a few school committee members who I'm sure will speak. Uh, all those things take collaboration. So all those, even Project Reconnect, it was again, a group of average citizens. This department collaborates with all those different citizens, with all those different agencies, with the school department and with the mayor's office and so many uh, agencies that are not even represented here tonight. And they do that willingly, they do that responsibly, and they do it professionally, as was already say, stated before. Uh, and I think that's really the value of, of this department, one that's really ingrained in our community, uh, one that is respected, uh, treated fairly, despite the challenges of the job. So I can't say enough good things. I could stay here all night and say more, uh, but I know there's a lot of people that will do an even better job than I will at telling you the true story of this great police department. So it's an honor to work with them every single day. Palmyra is the best. Uh, you really are uh, truly a special, special person to our community, and the chief as well has done a fabulous job with all the individuals. And of course, I can't forget Cantor. Cantor, are you speaking tonight too? Yeah. All right. <laughs> all right. Thank you so much. Questions? Good. Good. Thank you. Very okay. Much. Thank you, everybody. Carol Fiola. Here. For the record, I'm Carol Fiola, state representative of the 6th Bristol District, which is almost half of Fall River, lifelong resident of Fall River, um, and prior to being a state representative, I served on the Governor's Council uh, for 10 years. Um, I can't say enough about our Fall River Police Department through the years and as we stand here today. Uh, a lot has already been touched on, and you'll see reoccurring themes. I understand there's about 458 uh, check marks in this process that you uh, evaluate. I can't speak to most of them as I look through them, uh, but certainly the community piece, the community involvement that we see on a daily basis, um, I think is unique and outstanding here in Fall River. Uh, we attend neighborhood meetings. We have a strong neighborhood association um, structure here. Uh, volunteers, community leaders, uh, there is never a neighborhood meeting as has been referenced that police are not there and providing, uh, like you said, the truth 
uh, and uh, an open two ears to listen to what it is the neighborhoods are having concerns on, and then of course, most important, the follow-up afterwards. So I see that, I witness it, we attend meetings every month of all the neighborhood groups in our district. Uh, when I see the community, it was referenced, uh, the youth, whether it's in the schools, whether it's through this unique event that will be, I'm sure, touched upon more, Police of Palooza, where we bring together, we know the volatility in this country and in this, uh, with police and citizenry and urban communities and, and, and the drug crisis, everything. But here in Fall River, again, people are proactive and it's the community. It's not anyone, it's the community that comes together and the police are a huge piece of that. And it's here to, to make sure that our citizens have an up close um, relationship with our police. And I think that is why, while we are an urban community and certainly have its share of, uh, of issues and crime that is normal for communities, you don't see the, the, the hot bed issues come to the forefront because our police are on the streets and in the neighborhoods and see what's going on. Uh, the opioid crisis, I'm very, very involved in that, both at the state level and here. And I have to uh, point out again the Project Reconnect because I go out, I've been out with the police and the private uh, agencies knocking on doors post-opioid overdose and um, the police are not looked at as what the heck are the police doing here. It's a comforting feeling. The police are there because they want to help and that has been strongly established here in the city of Fall River and I need to stress that. I've also had the opportunity to go on drive-alongs. They're, they're very welcomed. I can call at any time and say I'd like to go out on Thursday night. Boom, it's arranged. And you go out there and you see. You see the difficult, the difficult um, dynamics out there. And I've never been out there and you could say, well, yeah, sure, the state rep's riding with them, but they are patient. In, in, in their handling of, of what I would look at and go, are you kidding me? Like, how can you be there and, 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 and not see this escalate? But I've seen patients. I see Sergeant Smith here and, 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 and Sergeant Hoare, who we know the faces because they're out in our community every day. So I think the opioid crisis, the neighborhood, uh, and the community uh, are all strong pieces. I don't want to take up time. Everybody else wants to speak, but I strongly support and encourage reaccreditation of the Fall River Police Department. And of course, I'll point out not only our chief, but Palmyra, who behind the scenes is just a warrior in making sure everything gets detailed uh, nicely. So thank you very much for being here and listening. Thank, thank you. you. Matthew Malone. Uh, my name is Matt Malone. I'm the superintendent of schools of the great city of... Uh, Fall River. Uh, I can't uh, speak highly enough of the uh, outstanding work of the Fall River Police Department. Uh, men and women that uh, put the uniform on and serve others in this community, uh, some of the best uh, law enforcement officers I've ever had the privilege to work with, and I've done this job uh, in four communities. I uh, served as the Secretary of Education for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. I can say uh, that I've seen uh, our police officers both uh, being proactive and reactive as needed. Uh, and I've always been amazed by their exceptional professionalism, their training, uh, their esprit de corps, uh, and most importantly, their love for the, for the city of Fall River. Uh, to protect and serve is uh, uh, core values that, uh, that uh, run deep uh, within our officers, uh, within our, uh, I think really all our public service agencies. We also have our fire chief here today who's also a partner to me. Uh, I speak with the chief, uh, I don't know, three or four times a week. Uh, I speak with the uh, sergeant of the SROs pretty much almost uh, every single day. Uh, those interactions that we have, we have seven SROs uh, in our schools uh, working uh, proactively uh, following the, uh, uh, the agreements that we have, both the uh, mandated uh, 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 MOU, but also uh, we have a, uh, an operational procedure uh, that we've developed in tandem with the experts uh, in the school folks to make sure that we have this very strong working relationship in line with the new state law around uh, uh, how uh, officers are used in schools. I will tell you uh, that uh, every day uh, I know that my teachers, my administrators, my students, and most importantly my parents, not my parents, but the parents that we serve, although my parents might be happy too to know uh, that I'm protected by the Fall River uh, Police Department and they really do their best every single day uh, to go out of their way. Uh, very unique uh, that I don't know if everyone even knows that the 
uh, the role of the SIU, SROs here in Fall River uh, is very unique in that the uh, essentially the uh, joint reporting status both in the, the police department then with our educational expertise it's a team and that team is uh, really what makes a difference we know if we have a, uh, situations uh, uh, we know uh, how well they'll be handled but more importantly what happens out on the streets uh, we're also uh, in close communication, there's transparency around sharing of information uh, to ensure that we know if there are any issues that uh, that may be concerning for school, uh, but also just uh, get, you know the 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 uh, hot string stuff. There's a fire, something happens, a family. It's on a Saturday night. I might not know that it affects three <coughs> of my students. Immediately, I get a call or a text. Uh, and I know, and then our crisis response team works to ensure that we can uh, serve those students in our schools uh, as needed. So with that, uh, I can close with saying that, uh, uh, that this city is uh, uh, as an exceptional uh, police department, uh, and, and they're led by tremendous, uh, caring, uh, professional, knowledgeable uh, public servants uh, who do, uh, you know, they, they, they run one way when everyone else runs the other way. And, uh, and we all need to be uh, uh, always uh, thankful for, uh, for that uh, force protection, but also that community building uh, and sense of uh, community. Thank you. Thank you. Christian McFoskey. Similar to Ms. Bavaris, I'm going to be making an early exit. I'm going to the same ordinance committee to support an initiative from students from middle school who want to outlaw knives for under 18 year olds. So I'm just there. Uh, my name is Chris McCluskey. I'm the Youth Services Coordinator for the City of Fall River. And in that capacity, I have the pleasure of being able to collaborate with many of the folks in this room. Uh, fire department, neighborhood groups, uh, different social service providers, school department, most of all, the police department. Um, I'm the grant coordinator for two violence prevention grants, the Shannon Community Safety Initiative and Safe and Successful Youth Initiative. Both of these are premised on that no one agency or one approach can solve all of the uh, problems facing communities. Um, usually with violence prevention, people think su suppression. When the grant first came out, I was very excited to apply. Let's include the police department. And the chief said, oh, we're already applying. So I just thought, everything's going to the police, but um, the biggest portion of that was for social services. Uh, these grants are focused on positive youth development, and the biggest part of positive youth development are caring adults and relationships. Uh, you had heard uh, Ms. Rivera's talking about the, the human touch, and that's really what the Forward Police Department brings to the table, going above and beyond just the suppression. So as you've already heard twice, people alluding to the police and public pollution. It's going to be taking place um, right outside of Britain Park. And this is our fourth annual event. Um, and it was a proactive, it wasn't a reactive of an event that was called to bring the community together. It was just something that then Chief Racine wanted to bring the community together in as Representative Fyla had mentioned, is building those relationships. So it's not um, Officer Smith, it's um, Schmitty. It's, it's knocking down those barriers and building those relationships. So that's just one event that takes place. Um, I r r run several initiatives, and it's like I put up the bat light and just send it out. And so Sergeant Smith and the police department are always the f first to respond. So every year we kick off uh, the school year with high fives, welcoming elementary school students back and it's like the village people so you have the firefighters you have the police you have doctors uh, but all welcoming the students it is getting to see a, a firefighter or a police officer in a different light um, work with them on different toy drives envelope stuffing uh, and what, something we do every several years is police youth dialogues it's, so working with at-risk and high-risk youth and getting 
the students to learn about the officers that not every officer is is mean and going to arrest them but that they came from similar backgrounds so it's, once again working on building on those relationships um, there are neighborhood cleanups uh, work they work closely with the boys and girls club and then they also do some for the neighborhoods with gang presentations and active shooters uh, so that's going more away from the relationships but just something else that they bring to the table and I Thank Chief Dupere for giving me this opportunity to be able to brag about how wonderful the Fort Police Department is. all know me too well. <laughs> well, let me start off saying I'm Natalie Mello from the Bank Street Neighborhood Association. Uh, we, the neighborhoods, have become the eyes and ears of our police department. Um, we started in 1989 uh, because of drive-by shootings and people getting shot in our neighborhoods where once, uh, once it back, where we couldn't even have pizza deliveries in our, in our neighborhood couldn't have taxi drivers come pick up people in the neighborhood. And then voila, started going to meet, I was going to meet with at the Flint neighborhood, which at the time was Kathy Assad. So when we had the drive-by shootings, I called Kathy and said, hey, blah, 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 this is what's going on. We met at her house. There we became the Bank Street Neighborhood Association. Um, I can name a lot of police officers because that's how close we become with the police officers. Um, I cannot ever say enough to be thankful for what they've done in our neighborhood. You can walk our neighborhood and not worry. We still have, you know, things here and there like any other neighborhood, but people are not in fear like they used to be, not in fear of getting shot, not in fear about a John trying to pick you up. I'm just being, I'm point blank. I tell you as it is. Um, gangs. Um, like Chris McCloskey said, uh, we, there was a lot of gangs in our neighborhood and throughout the city. Um, and um, the youth called me, just, I'm going to be jumping all over the place, so I apologize. The youth called Nina. Um, we have a lot of those young kids that need extra help, guidance from the police department. They come to our community garden that we built a few years ago and they help out. They feel so proud of that. Um, I know I'm jumping all over the place. Um, we have a lot of our police officers, I can name names, that would come into the parks and see kids with torn sneakers. They would tell the kids, stay here, don't, you know, don't go anywhere. Uh, they come back with a pair of sneakers for those, for those kids that don't have any. Or things like that, that they go above and beyond. Uh, Christmas, I can't tell you enough what these police officers do for these children out there. I, I can't tell you truckloads that we do. Uh, a lot of us get together at one of the churches on Plymouth Avenue and it's amazing what they do. Um, I think a lot of our police officers, they have a lot of courage. They sacrifice a lot right along with their families. Not being there for holidays when, it, when the time comes or the children's birthday, it's not an easy job. I and the respect, they, need, they, earn, they earn their respect. They have earned their respect throughout the years. I just, uh, our quality of life throughout the city definitely has improved over the years with our police department. Try not to forget too many things, and the visibility of our police department is huge in our city should be like that and anywhere throughout the state of Massachusetts. I over um, I think that's about it that I can think of. Um, I just want the, the officers that are here, I want to thank them for always being always going above and beyond for all our neighborhoods and our, my neighborhoods, which has improved a lot. So thank you. Almira, above and beyond. John O'Neill. 
Uh, good evening. Uh, for those that I have not had a chance to meet, my name is John O'Neill. Uh, I am the clerk magistrate over at the district court. I've uh, been there almost nine years. Prior to that, I practiced law for about 26 years and a lifelong resident of the city. I, I would say I come from a little bit different approach than your previous speakers, because my deal with the police department is on a professional level, and we need to deal with each other on a daily basis. Um, the police will come to the court every day, every single day. They have a liaison unit, approximately four officers and a captain, uh, four, three detectives and a captain, and they'll bring the, the daily arrest or the overnight arrest or the weekend arrest, whatever it is. In our office, the job of the clerk is to look at the arrest, see if there's probable cause, sign the complaint, and get him into court. And we do not agree all the time with the police department, and they don't agree with us, but we, at least we have, can have an intelligent discussion on why we differ. And I'll tell you, more times than not, they will convince me why a certain charge is in the report. And if it's not, they'll be able to go to the officer who wrote the report and say, hey, you need to, if this is a subsequent offense, you need to tell us it's a subsequent offense. So they'll get the information that we need to do our jobs. It's never an argument, it's never a hassle, they do it on a daily basis. Uh, additionally, we deal, everybody talks about the uh, opioid and mental health problem. We also deal with a different officer for that. And a lot of times in the word of apprehension has to be issued, that has to be issued quickly. It needs to get the out to get the person who needs the help to get him into court. And whenever we call up the forward police department, it's Officer Dave LaFleur, he's probably there within five minutes. He'll be there to pick up the paperwork and he goes out himself or gets other officers to help him and finds this person that needs this assistance and gets him into court in front of a doctor, in front of a judge. <clears throat> Additionally, Farber is one of the few departments in our community that we deal with at the Fort Worth Courthouse, our jurisdiction, that has a booking room. And it's not the best time that you see people, but the booking officers in this department treat those prisoners with respect. And they don't treat someone, and I say this all the time, and Fort has no problem doing it, just because someone has been arrested doesn't mean that person is a bum. They just did something wrong, they've been accused of a crime, and they're going to come to court and deal with it. The Fort Worth police officers always treat them with respect. And again, I hate to say it this way, but when you're dealing with prisoners and we all have uh, frequent flies, we see them on a regular basis, and you try to deal with respect because we don't want to start a problem with them. We just want to deal with them on a, on a professional basis and respectful basis so we can all get, get through the day. Additionally, Fort Worth Police Department has to serve our restraining orders, our harassment orders, uh, they come to us repeatedly for search warrants in order to go search a place and also for arrest warrants. And I can tell you that the quality of the work that they bring to us is, is, is top notch. Uh, they've been trained well. Uh, I mean, we're, I'm an attorney. Most of my assistants that work in the courthouse are attorneys. And we look at a search warrant maybe in a different way than a lay person would look at it. And you look at it and say, you think about it for a second. You want to go into this person's house to do what? And doesn't sound like much. Well, they committed a crime. I said, well, show me. And we'll sit there and have a discussion. And again, it's very respectful, very professional. And these officers are well-trained. The detectives are well-trained. I think that's a reflection on the chief and his command staff as you go down the training that these officers have. So my approach, as I said earlier, is a little bit different. It's on a professional level. Um, I deal with probably six other police departments. And I'll tell you right now, the former police has the bulk of the work that we deal with on a daily basis and they do handle it a professional, and they treat the people that they deal with from my office to the people out on the street with respect. We very rarely have a problem, and if we do, we just have a discussion. We don't always agree, but we can have a discussion and, and deal with it that way, and I think that's a credit to the Chief and his command staff. So I would be wholeheartedly in support of the uh, reaccreditation of the Fort Worth Police Department. Thank you. John Lynch. Good evening. For those of you who don't know me, I'm John D. Lynch, the Fire Chief of Fall River. I've been a member of the Florida Fire Department for 33 plus years. The last three years as the Fire Chief, the previous three years as the Deputy of Operations and Personnel. So I'm very, very familiar with the Fort Worth Police Department. Now most of you see me out in public, I'm usually advocating for the fire department or begging for money and equipment. 
So it's kind of a pleasure that I get to stand here and actually be a champion for the Florida Police Department. Because I don't think there's a fine enough police department in the state. In my 33 years, we've always had a great working relationship with the police department and the EMS. But normally it was in support of one another's operations. We'd, go, we'd have fires and our brothers in blue would show up and make the scene safe and secure for us. They would go to their scenes and we would support them also. But now I think we're in a different type of relationship. And this is why I believe that they should be reaccredited. Uh, because they're no longer just a regular police department. They're actually a very progressive police department. They stand at the forefront of the whole state. And I know this from being a Bristol County Chief and a Chief of Massachusetts. When I go to these meetings, our discussions always come up about our operations. And one of the things that we've been able to do with the police department, because they've been so progressive, is now we have an actual public safety department. It's a bond between EMS, the police, and fire, where we work together in integrated operations. And that isn't so easy, because in talking with the other chiefs, a case of active shooter training, it's a big plus in the city of Fall River that we have that. And that's thanks to the police department who took the initiative. So today, we actually have an integrated uh, active shooter uh, department. It's EMS, police, and fire. We actually did active training together for over months and months. And that's a huge, huge accomplishment. But that's just one of them. We've also had to deal with the, the drug crisis. That's a great partnership between the police department, EMS, and fire. We all have Narcan, but it goes beyond just administering Narcan. It's a training that we do together. It's Project Reconnect, which I'll give you all the information on here. I'm sure there's going to be other people speaking of it. That's also something that's very progressive that a lot of the other departments don't have. So I'm here to support wholeheartedly this police department's accreditation. We also do a lot of training together besides just the active shooter training. We go in and we train the police officers in our operations, what we do, so they understand what we're doing out there. And that's been a huge plus. We also share the same dispatch center, where our officers intermingle with their officers. And that's unheard of. There's so many departments in the city, uh, not in the city, in the state, and across the country, where things are separated. And that's not the case here. We have a great working partnership, and it goes beyond that. It's almost an integration. And that's very, very progressive. And that's due to the leadership of the police department more than anything else. So I'm here to support them, and I hope you all be accredited. Alan and Sylvia. I'd give a comments that we don't get up here. Make it a little nervous. Uh, my name is Alan Sylvia. I'm a state legislator. I represent a, a good portion of Fall River. I just represent Fall River. About 50,000 folks here. I happen to be the uh, vice chair of the Joint Committee on Public Safety and Homeland Security for the Commonwealth and um, a former police officer. The uh, mayor and a few people mentioned uh, this is not your grandfather's police department. Well, that was my police department. I came on in 1975. Um, I left uh, due to a, a fractured vertebrae in 1998. Um, so things have changed. Police work has changed. And uh, I'm also president of the Neighborhood Association in the South End, one of the largest neighborhood associations in the city. And that neighborhood, and many of the, ad, the advent of the Neighborhood Association is all of them basically in Fall River was because of public safety issues. And um, we, like all of them, started for that reason. And I am so proud to say that there has not been one meeting. We have a meeting every month. We skip the month of July because uh, of the uh, holiday. It's the first Thursday of the month, 6.30 to 7.30. We have uh, approximately 70 to 90 
uh, neighbors uh, from that part of the city who attend. There has never been a meeting where we have not had police officers present to give a report to neighbors and uh, to listen to neighbors. I always tell our neighbors that they're blessed to be able to have a situation where uh, police officers are there uh, to hear them and to talk about their personal issues, their street, what's happening right on the corner of their street. Because so many people have issues that happen in their direct neighborhood, not the larger neighborhood, but in their direct neighborhood, that they keep, uh, they don't get the vent about. And uh, our police officers being present, one of them is always here, Sergeant Smith, uh, Josh Carrero, who's not here, um, people know their names, they know who they are. I always, we're the only neighborhood association that is filmed so that that neighborhood meeting can be televised over cable uh, to residents who are not present. And uh, we always ask neighbors to go off camera to talk to the police um, following the meeting. Uh, police officers always stay on no matter how long it takes to listen to their issues and their concerns. And we have solved crime as a result of that. Crimes have been solved as a result of police interaction at our neighborhood meetings. And I look out there and I see very caring presidents of neighborhoods who uh, have the same thing happen to them. And that is so important in a community. When I think back of uh, in the 1970s when we first ta talked about community policing, you know, uh, because there was a time when it, things weren't so sensitive, you know, that sensitivity wasn't there. Uh, for the last eight years in the Major Crimes Division, I was a detective for 19 of those years. For the last eight years, I was assigned to the Child Sexual Abuse Unit. We had 250 members on that department then. What do we have now, Chief, here? Many total 220. Amazing. There's not much difference in the size of the population, and the officers do much more. Um, I can't even say how many of them volunteer time and hours. Uh, Natalie, when she was up, um, she mentioned uh, cleanup, city cleanup. And I'll just give you that as an example because on so many occasions we've had neighborhood cleanups. Every single time we have members of the police department volunteering uh, to participate in the cleanup. Listen, when I was on, we didn't do that unless we were getting paid overtime. And uh, they're doing this for free. They're doing this because they care about their community. That's amazing to me. And that doesn't happen in other departments. One of the benefits I have of being Vice Chair of the Joint Committee on Public Safety, and I'm there for a hearing on Thursday, I was just talking about it, we're talking about police cameras. Who would have thought we'd have body cameras, huh? When I came on the job, we good thing we didn't have body cameras. But now, that's something that's happening right now as we speak. But I hear about police departments that have serious problems, major problems. It's not happening here. And I have to credit our chief, credit our supervisors that are on the street, because it all starts at the top, we know that. Anyone who's worked for a police department knows it's from the top down, you know? It rots from the top down. And if you have a good leadership, and you have good line supervisors, it really solves lots of the issues. And I am so proud to say uh, that I'm part of this community and that uh, we have one of the greatest police departments in this commonwealth. Uh, I say that without, without doubt. You know, I'm looking around, I was thinking, how many police officers are left when I, when I work with them? None, hardly any. Palmyra's still here. <laughs> I, don't mean, I don't mean that in a terrible way. But that was a long time ago. You're still hanging on. Thank God. But, uh, it, it's amazing when I see the difference of what it was. Not that it was bad back in the 70s and the 80s, but what it is today. The sensitivity, the caring about kids, about, about elderly. I see police officers interact with our elderly about issues that you would, 30 years ago you would have said, please, I'm not interested in that right now. You know, they, they care, they show concern. And as a result of that, the people respect our police officers. So I highly, uh, I could go on for another half hour as well, but I <laughs> highly recommend them 
for their reaffirmation. Thank you so much. I am the former director of Fall River Youth Court, which is part of South Coast Youth Courts. Um, we are one of two youth courts in the Commonwealth, and um, we have been operating for 17 years. In Fall River, we've been operating um, since 2009. Um, I say former director because that'll be important in a second. I'm now the consultant. Um, so when we started in Fall River, uh, we were coming from New Bedford, which is a sister city not far from here, very similar demographics. And it was actually the police department, different administration at the time, but it was the Fall River Police Department that made that call for us to come over and start a program here in Fall River. Um, and it was the chief of police at the time who sat in front of the school committee and told them why they needed a youth court and that they should start one. Um, and so we did. So since the very beginning, it was the police department that saw the need for a prevention program here in the city of Fall River. And speaking from someone who shares a household with a police officer um, and understands that it's really difficult to sell the idea of prevention to someone who faces the intervention piece every day and sees the other side of it, um, it's really wonderful to see a department who under really understands the um, idea of prevention and the importance of getting to the children before it gets out of control. And in the society and especially a community that um, there is that high risk population and there is the high, higher crime portion of it um, to deal with prevention and to try to sell that, especially when finances are not always there, it's really tough. So we've had that uh, support since the beginning, um, even in times when we thought we would lose that financing and did. Um, the police department has always been there in support. Um, and for this particular administration, has always somehow found ways very innovatively to um, either hook us up to um, other agencies or representatives to find ways to pair up to look for finances, whether that was other grants um, or funding opportunities or having me shake hands with someone that was going to find me a funding opportunity. Um, just different ways of doing that. So really thinking outside of the box and as a community partner and having to deal with other police departments throughout the Commonwealth, I've never encountered that. So that is a really amazing um, you know, personality or a characteristic that this department has that I don't see a lot of. Um, on the flip side of that, I am also located here in the station and happen to be outside of the Chief's office. So I also, also get to see the in-house stuff, which um, Surprisingly enough, this department has an amazing, which you've heard a lot of already, um, just an amazing personnel. And, um, you know, it speaks volumes when the staff enjoy each other and have a tremendous respect for each other. And not that that should be a reason for accreditation, but when you have that working capability and people can work across departments and within each other, it makes just for a, a better working relationship all around. And I think you see that when you're talking to everyone in this room. Thank you very much. And as, well, that's the other thing. So after 17 years of doing this and being here since 2009, this is why it's okay to move on now and to leave my baby to someone else because it's in good hands. So absolutely all, all of my love and respect for this department. Thank you. Richard Wolberg. Captain Boykin uh, set a time limit of five minutes. If I spoke five minutes, I'd be fired. <laughs> if I spoke four minutes, I'd be on probation. <laughs> so I'll speak three minutes. As chaplain for the Fall River Police Department for over a decade, I have gained a tremendous amount of insight and experience into many areas. My background is varied, and as I told Captain Chase, I'm originally from Hartford, Connecticut, and my background includes law enforcement in New York City and serving as a clergyman and spiritual leader 
for 36 years. I once watched a commencement speech by Jim Carrey, and two things he said have stuck out in my mind, and I quote, Beware of the unloved, because they will eventually hurt themselves or me. And the effect you have on others is the most valuable currency there is. And as chaplain here, I hope I have had an effect, a very good effect, on many of our officers and employees. There are many, many people that I have counseled that nobody will ever know except those people. Presently, I'm in the process of taking a national course in peer counseling, and once certified, I will be in even a better position of fulfilling and enhancing my duties. I'm the fourth police chaplain in the history of the country to have graduated a police academy, and I find it humorous everyone is telling you about a police officer as if you guys never knew. But as you well know, being a police officer is one of the most trying and stressful careers. We may see more negativity in one day than the average citizen sees in a lifetime. I have been hands-on in this department. I know each and every one, without exception, of our police officers and many of their families. I have officiated at officers' weddings and, unfortunately, other occasions for the less fortunate circumstances. I have read all of our policies and I'm impressed with the substantive contents. I have worked together with Chief Dupere in making our department strong and viable. And in conclusion, I try to live by three main principles. One, one should be able to disagree without being disagreeable. Two, discipline is the trademark of civility. And three, there but for the grace of God go I. I thank you for the opportunity to share with you my mission. Earl Godet. Thank you. It's an honor and it's a pleasure for me to be able to speak uh, for the Forever Police Department at this time. To give you my history, <coughs> I'm a native of Fall River. I'm a product of the Depression. I remember when I was growing up as a boy in the, in the 1930s when we loved and respected our firefighters and our police officers and we saw them in the Union in their, in their uniforms going out there. I only can speak as from Maplewood. Maplewood is like a small community of its own. Most of the residents are single family owner occupied homes. The multi unit homes are usually occupied by one or two or three generations of the same family. I find that as a close knit community, we are not a high crime area, and we love and know our neighbors. And with this, I have to say, with the Forever Police Department, when Officer Kimball and Officer Holland and Sergeant Smith come, we're a close-lit neighborhood, but we accept them as one of our own. We love them as our own. We. Uh, they really don't have to be proactive because we do not have that much crime in our neighborhood. The crime that we do have usually is domestic or shoplifting in one of the stores. So that, uh, but when Sergeant Smith comes into the meeting, our people just look at him in awe. I think many of the members of our community come because they want to hear what the Sergeant has to say. Those who are actually nervous and will not speak before the group will turn around and they will meet them one-on-one -on -one. so that although they're not proactive I have to say that they are excellent reactive because there is never a problem in my community 
that has never been solved because the police department will come in there and at our next meeting they will advise us of the action they have taken. So that I'm not here to speak for the entire police department, but I will speak for the portion that I am active with in my neighborhood, and that's uh, Officer Kimball, Officer Holland, and Sergeant Smith. Thank you very much for the pleasure of being here. Thank you. And, and, and I, I take offense when you talk about the grandfather's police department because I have my great grandchildren who love the police department too. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Thomas Corey. Thank you. It's an honor to be here tonight to represent the Florida the Police Department. I come as a, a, a career educator. Spent my career working primarily at Durfee High School as a social worker, a counselor. And um, we formed programs called Peaceful Coalition, working directly with gang members in the city, targeting gang members and inviting them to become part of our larger group. As um, we continued in our endeavors to work on that program, I'm honored tonight by having some of my colleagues in the room with me here, um, Michaela Hetzler and um, Christian McCluskey, who, was, who testified earlier. It speaks to the deep degree of collaboration <clears throat> that we've had in the schools and with the city youth in regard to the Fall River Police and uh, the level of communication. And I've heard many give testimony here tonight to the heart and the, uh, growing, the, the growing sensitivity of the police officers in the city. And that is totally true. Uh, the relationships that we've had with the city police, especially the SROs in the schools, has been to a high degree, a high level of cooperation, uh, a high level of collaboration between the two departments, interactive with the, the city youth, especially the, the neediest of the city youth in this community. We've worked with the real hardcore gang members of the past. And I'm pleased to note that the gang issue today is far less than it was 15 and 20 years ago when it was really raging and we really needed to address those issues. So I'm extremely proud of, of the, the kind of work that we were able to achieve together. I know that Christian testified earlier to the uh, police youth dialogues. The police youth dialogues are rather amazing. Michaela and I and Christian and Paul Coogan have uh, organized groups of some of the most, I'd say, some of the most volatile students at the high school. And you sit around a big circle with a few police officers in the circle and the school counselors and the kids. And when you have a chance to listen to their testimony and then they have the opportunity to talk straight up to a police officer. Amazing things happen as a result. And we've had many of those dialogues in the past. And I can't help but think that it's improved the relationship between some of the most volatile city youth we've had and the police themselves, as well as the educators involved. It improves school climate it improves social climate in the city and it just gives you a strong feeling of pride knowing what you've achieved trying to reach a kid heart to heart a kid and a cop it's just really awesome to see um, I've done a lot of work with the neighborhood associations I know that Natalie mentioned the late Kathy Assad um, she created a wonderful model in this city with the neighborhoods and I've had a chance to interact with Sergeant Hoare and Sergeant Smith at those meetings and um, it's just great to know that we, we've got a thumb on some of the small crime but also some of the more larger crimes that are happening and that we keep a real pulse on that. So I'm very, very proud. I've, I'm a lifelong resident of this community, a retired educator and now I sit on the school committee 
and uh, continue to uh, advocate for programs such as the SRO program we have. Uh, we have a strong memorandum of understanding with the SROs and a deep dialogue with them. And because I know so many of them from my past work as an educator, it's, uh, the dialogue we have is rather amazing right now. So it's, it's an honor for me to be here to testify on behalf of what I think is an awesome police department. Thank you. talk this late in the program, everything's been said, and I want to thank you for that from lovely Nightdale, North Carolina. Um, the police in this community have a very, very profound role. Um, I worked with them every day for 20 years. I probably worked with 20 or 30 different offices as a vice principal at Derby High School. Uh, those were our SROs. I remember the first one that was in the schools, Andy Phillips, up to what we have now, a, a force of seven. Um, they were all on point, carry themselves professionally. Um, you could be in the most horrific situation um, between different people in dispute and they would handle it professionally and they would come in your office later, a half hour later, and you debrief on the situation and you get back to work. Um, I think that has a lot to do with the climate they're established in the school. They weren't, they weren't looked as outsiders in the building. They were looked as part of the group that walked around the building all day talking to parents, staff, and kids. Um, I'll address two situations that uh, cast our city in a negative light and, how, and its effect on the community. Uh, because as I said, everything's been said. Um, we had a young man who uh, lost his life uh, in the middle of the night in the industrial park very bad situation for the family and everybody. What that did to the community, very, very little, calm. Because people respect the police in this situation. The family might have been upset, but there was no outcrying, there was no protest, there was no marches, there was only calm. A bad situation comes about in every community, handled calmly. This year we had a fight um, at an alternative school in the city big, big play on YouTube and some of the videos. Um, a little bubble up, but they were back at work the next day or the day after because they have that kind of respect from that community. The community they deal with looks at them in a positive light. I was at the end of the year at the cookout with uh, those two officers were at, were at the school. And there was nobody shunning them or looking at them as, as someone who had done something wrong. They were looking at them as, looking at them as people that did their job and let's continue to work. I think those two, those two instances speak volumes to what's going on, not, not just from the um, excellent leadership we have in the department, but from the climate that's created that lets people move around freely and feel comfortable with the people that are around them. And I think that that's what happens in schools, and I think that that's what happens in the community. And again, um, I appreciate you letting me have the opportunity to talk. and. Uh, I might not have liked the police when I was 17, but they're great guys. <laughs> um, some of these news organizations, I'm not sure, if, are they on here because they want to speak? Okay. Hit, just tell me who you are. Chuck Gregory. Okay. I'm sorry. My leg's fast asleep. <laughs> um, my name is Chuck Gregory. Uh, I'm on the list because I'm the publisher of the Tribune. But I'm also on the list because I go back in the police department further than anybody in the room. It started when I was seven. My father was a cop. My mother, as it says on my birth certificate, was a hooker. She made rugs. We laughed about that. My father was a very good sport when he wasn't in the police station. I'm probably the hottest critic he ever had, and I love them every second of the day. I never took any grief from him, because he didn't give me any. He let me be me. He let me run every organization that I put my fingers on, and when I got recognized, he shook my hand. I wouldn't be me today if he wasn't him then. The police now 
are much what I envisioned they would be. From back in the days with Ray Reddy, Dave Machado, Jimmy Machado, the schoolovers early on, Frank McDonald, those guys. They were police. But they didn't branch out like they do now. I'm lucky to be on the Poor Sox press corps and the PGA tournaments. I'm lucky to do a lot of that stuff because the follower of honor guard is there. They're all in uniform. They all wink when they go by and I smile. Later on we might have a, a soda, shall we say, and shoot the breeze. I'm also there when Bill Macy leads the bikes in the three bike runs that I help run. The motorcycle corps here isn't a gang of guys going up and down the street making noise. The motorcycle corps in the fall of a police department leads parades, circles people to make sure they go in the right direction when they're heading down towards the waterfront. The motorcycle <coughs> cops line across the street so the parade goes the right way and doesn't get lost on North Main. That's what it's all about. You have police officers that are at every festival. Every organization has some meeting, they're there. They talk. They always say, hi, Chuck. Nobody ever brings up the day I was an alcoholic. I was an alcoholic a lot of days. A lot of cops helped me. Later on, I helped them. Let's put it that way. But I wouldn't be here now without them, my dad, or all of the other cops I ever knew. God bless you. Thank you. Hetzler. Hi, my name is Michaela Hetzler. I am a youth violence prevention coordinator uh, in the city and I also serve as a mental health counselor at one of the local high schools. Um, I've worked very closely uh, with the SROs directly in the schools for the last nine years and um, you've heard, again, I don't want to repeat too much of what's been said, but you've heard a lot about the relationships that have been built. And it's not just watching them in action, it's seeing the impact that it has on these kids, uh, whether they are able to have those one-on-one -on -one conversations with a police officer in the school, or whether those police officers are there for them in a court case, um, you know, where a kid has been sexually abused. Um, all of it, they, the relationships they've built with these kids is unbelievable. Um, I think that um, I can bring up a couple other things that haven't been mentioned. Uh, working in the high school, the, the police department was wonderful in bringing active shooter training to our staff members. And not only, you know, doing it in, um, it was doing it in a very comforting and safe way to know, you know, we're prepared and we're ready. And it made the staff feel very safe to know that there were these action plans in place and there was this collaboration that was happening um, already in the community. Um, and I think you've heard a ton about how the police department takes care of others, but they take care of their own as well. Um, I'm one of the chairs for the Suicide Prevention Coalition in the city and in the past year I had approached the chief and said, you know, um, we'd really love to provide you guys with um, training for all staff for suicide prevention. Middle, you know, men in high-risk careers is on the rise for suicides. It's, it's a really scary statistic and without hesitation he agreed to it and you know, they are going through the process where every single uh, police officer will be trained in suicide prevention to help themselves and one another. And I think that's really commendable because um, it can be a very difficult topic. It can be really um, difficult to get people on board with that sort of stuff. And, and there was no hesitation. So uh, to see them also take care of each other in that way is very commendable. Thank you. Laura Ferreira. Ferreira. <laughs> Good afternoon, my name is Laura Ferreira. Um, I oversee the Traffic and Parking Division for the City of Fall River. I'm the parking clerk. Um, I've been with the city since 1996, but have been interacting with the police department since 2002. Um, I interact with the SROs regarding the schools, um, whether it's the concern of the safety of the children, speeding, how parents park, um, I just make a phone call, we come together, and we always try to come up with a solution where it's safe for the children. Um, the SROs do a wonderful job um, in trying to make sure that the schools are safe for kids, um, as well as, you know, educating parents um, how to park more carefully, 
um, with the safety of children. Um, I deal um, a lot with special ops. One of my favorite things is parking bans because I get to work with uh, special ops who helps out tremendously. Um, it's a pleasure to see them coming together, um, helping out, making sure the city is safe through <coughs> the storm, make sure that ambulances, fire, um, police can get to anyone's home when it's needed. And it's really them working sometimes 16, 18 hours. I'm here with them, so I see how hard they work. Um, and their important thing is making sure that the city is safe during storms. Um, I also work with uniform division um, when there are special events in the city, um, how professional they are, putting together the best offices that they have to make sure that these events um, go smoothly. We just had 4th of July and it went very smoothly and that's due to our police department coming together, knowing what they're doing and working together. Um, I interact with them a lot when it comes to neighborhoods. Um, a lot of the office, like Sergeant Smith, uh, will email me with concerns that the neighborhoods have with speeding, signage. Um, I always find that. I always call them for the best advice. What do you think would be the best <coughs> signage to go up? Um, you know, how can we make this safer? Um, the response that I get from them, um, their knowledge is unbelievable um, of the streets as well. Um, I also have a traffic board where I have two officers. Um, I have a sergeant and a officer that are members of the board um, who give their ideas, um, approve certain um, items that are that are in front of the traffic board. Um, they're considerate for the neighborhood um, and what's safe also for the neighborhoods. Um, speeding, um, we get a lot of calls. Unfortunately, they think we're <laughs> the police department, but we're not. But all I have to do is I call the chief a lot. He knows I call special ops. And they always assist by making sure that they either put the trailer up for the speeding, see what the speeding is, you know, do a report. Um, special ops always helps me out with giving me reports of accidents so that we can present it um, as to why we don't need a stop sign or why we do need a stop sign. Um, all of them, respectful. Um, I come to their home. I call it their home, and they're very respectful, professional, um, an unbelievable uh, view on, view, blue uniform uh, gentleman. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Peter Jasinski. Oh, I'm just a okay. member of the press. Pamela Nickerson. Same. Michael. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody speak? else who didn't sign in who would like to speak? You got something to say, please? Do I? Oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> no recycle of voice. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, I thought I was speaking tomorrow, sir. <laughs> Captain, do you need me to sign, sign in? Man? No, I got you. Okay. Okay. I'll put him here. I'll put him here. All right. My name is Sergeant Smith, uh, James Smith. That's my real name. Um, I'll see you guys, uh, captains, tomorrow at Special Ops for our investigation. Um, they they kind of covered everything. I've had the opportunity to work over the years with numerous police departments. I earned my master's degree on a job, so rubbed elbows with numerous police departments. And definitely not not um, political BS, but we, we really go above and beyond for the city. It's always been that way with the leadership, kind of like I'm a Marine Corps veteran, like mission accomplishment, troop welfare, but we really look out for the community. Um, there's a lot of things we do from a law enforcement prong, but also a social prong. So we, we do, our unit does routinely monthly sweeps with the parole board. We also do them with probation. We built up partnerships that we have uh, th through Chief Dupere. We have a forever officer attached to the FBI task force. So we didn't lose a four of the police officer, we gained an FBI agent, state police, and we have like a six-man team, they come down. Um, the same with the DEA of collaboration through narcotics. But there's other things we do. I, I know Michaela, she had left, so we do on our own time uh, rape aggression defense. So it's a women's self-defense class, so the police officers donate their time with martial arts training. It's usually myself, Officer Hedaya that assist the civilian and a small business owner, successful small business owner. So any uh, women and uh, females, matter of fact, Palmyra set one up for the girls of the Liberty Utilities Gas Company. 
Um, we do the Warren Swoops you talked about, but things on like Halloween night. Um, there's unfortunately with the urban cities, you have a lot of level two, level three sex offenders. The level three is most likely to reoffend. So we worked worked out a project with the probation department called Operation Lights Out. So if policemen will go in plain clothes; they don't realize we're a policeman, and just ensuring that the level threes that are still on parole or probation that have attacked the little children that we go out and ensure that their lights are off with the stipulations of pro and then I'm attempting to entice children into the um, into the house for, for candy or things to that effect. Um, we've been able to shut some of them down. One of the pedophiles that was convicted, he had time hanging over his head that he was trying to open up a, a kid's shop with like baseball cards and almost kind of like luring the kids in um, with the judge, we're able to shut it down. I wish probation was here tonight. Um, we work with them regularly, the state police VFAST gentlemen who's a state police detective sergeant. He's the violent fugitive apprehension section. So we do weekly sleeps with him as well. Um, what else do we do uh, as far as the community? Um, we, we do bats. We built up a relationship with Lou Adu. He's also a small business owner. He's been instrumental. You've seen him in a paper. Um, he owns Access Bats. So it's a professional, he creates professional wooden baseball bats for the Major League Baseball. He has a contract with some of the farm leagues such as Pawtucket Red Sox, as well as the Boston Red Sox. So for some of them, he had set it up with the police department and through Chief Dupier. Am I over my five minutes, Captain? Like, I, all right, I'm long-winded, it's the Irish in me. Um, I, I talk fast. Um, so some of the kids that are indigent, if they, if they maintain an A grade average, we go to the Boys and Girls Club and we, we presented them bats. So, for the major leagues, it's probably a $500 bat, but if it has an imperfection in the wood, they can't use it. So we would do when some of the policemen, we, we've sanded down the bats, painted them. They're personally inscribed. They're, they're floating around a building, so we do that. Um, we go to the boys club a couple times a year, so they don't see us as, hey, it's, oh, all right, thank you. <laughs> She's making notes. We, we go to the Boys and Girls Club for the Make-A-Wish Foundation, obviously a uh, tremendous program for the kids that lost Dying Wish. So there's probably uh, 20 or so police officers, including the chief, and we go stuff envelopes for the Make-A-Wish Foundation at the Boys Club every year. Um, but also, like, a lot of the guys in the room, I, I know the chief grew up in the city, I do jujitsu, Chief Lynch with his son, but a lot of them like city kids, so I went to the Boys and Girls Club. So you, you have that rapport with the kids, so it's not, hey, the, the fat, bald sergeant, like, I was gonna tell me, uh, like, uh, policeman, no, it's Smitty, hey, you know something? Uh, you don't have to be a rich kid from the suburbs to go to college. I didn't think I could do it till I went to the Marine Corps. So you kind of you, you break down some of those barriers and like, oh wow, hey, that that, that cop grew up in the same neighborhood I did. Yeah, right. I lived at Ruggles Park and got into trouble um, as a little kid. N nothing major, like stealing grapes. <laughs> I think it was a 1970s cop that gave me a smack in the mouth. <laughs> I deserved it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so it was a point, a lesson well well deserved. Uh, taking grapes when I shouldn't have. Um, but it, it's, it's just good. We, we really do a lot. There's other things that when they were rattling off in my head. Um, the neighborhood groups, they, they really are our eyes and ears. There's 15 active. The cities, I know on paper, I think the population comes in at like 94,000 people. But the, the city's well over 100,000. There's a lot of people here that, that are not on the census. So if, if the woman is living in the housing project and the boyfriend's a convicted felon for drugs or a gang member, they can't list them on a Section 8 certificate or in the projects. But we know he's living here. We, we just uh, we can't lock him in. So uh, there's 15 neighborhood groups. We actively meet with 10 of, 10 of them at least every month. Some of them will call from time to time. Um, the State Successful Youth Initiative has been huge. There's 351 cities and towns in the state. There's only 13 or 14 of them that are considered gateway cities with some urban problems and blight and high crime areas. So we have some pockets with gang activity. So it's literally, I, I kind of use the example of like the Pantene commercial and the Chiefs kept it going. So kind of like Pantene commercial and when I had hair, uh, <laughs> you, you like, you tell your friend, they tell their friend. So like when we when be able to clip a couple of these gang members that my guys monitor them, we have the seven walking beats that are part of the bike patrol when I have five active gang officers that, that work for me on the Chief Dupair's discretion. Um, so like when you're able to pull one of them out of the gang and it, you see some of the kids eight, nine years old, like we're following them on social media. Um, this isn't televised uh, locally, you're following them on social media. 
um, and they kind of have the kid drinking a 40 or trying to smoke marijuana when they're 10 or 11, if you can pluck that gang member out, then the kids are all good and then the nephews are good and you kind of, you're breaking that chain. So we've had some success stories. Uh, one of the guys was involved in a shooting home invasion. He was doing the right thing for years. They have a few other ones. There's one brother, unfortunately the whole family, they ended up convicted drug traffickers, but one of them found youth court and it's just a youth success story with the city. So he probably would have went the wrong way, but they managed to put him on the right path. Um, I think those are some of the things. Uh, I know you guys are both big shots on the job, captains. Do you have any questions for us or uh, no? Uh, okay. Uh, anyone have any questions? Okay. Sorry, wrong with that. I, I do know everyone now. Uh, so uh, that's it. Um, definitely, we, we have a great rapport with the community. You know what I mean? So it's it's nice. They accept us. We accept them. Um, and I don't know who talked about it. I, I think it was Mr. Gregory too that. You see some of the, the, the backlash in the community, and I speak, think it speaks volumes for the community and the police. Um, when you had Ferguson, Missouri, um, and you, you had some of the other high-profile cases, we're not getting that nationwide backlash of their, their boycotting and bad-mouthing the police. And um, we, we've had some small marches here that uh, a small bedroom community outside here had more problems than the Fall River Police Department did. When, when they were walking through uh, for an informational picking on something, but we're not getting that violence towards the police from like Boston, some of the other cities, um, just kind of like we're, we're down at their level and vice versa, they're at our level. So we're not talking down to them, um, just in, it's a great rapport. Uh, is that it? Okay, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> oh, uh, incapacitative justice too, I'm, I'm thinking outside the box. But in some of the neighborhood groups, like they said too, um, obviously we target the big fish, so uh, gang members and drug dealers, and if we can't pluck them out of the gang. But some of the small things too, with the district attorney's office, um, no, he's not here today. Um, so some of the quality of life issues that Chief Dupere will, will enforce that the judge is tired of seeing them, so like the unlicensed, unvaccinated pit bull, the nickel and diamond with a fine, and kind of gets them off the corner, so people are not afraid to walk that corner. They're drinking a, a 40 ounce in public, so if, if and it's it's discretion. So we're not whacking a mechanic that just got out of work and, and he's drinking a beer from a koozie, but it's the guys on the corner they're drinking with a bag and stuff. But we know they're all gang members. They're convicted of guns and drug charges. So we nickel and diamond with the small misdemeanor charges. I love Bill Bratton and, and Chief Dupair, and the judges like, hey, I'm tired of seeing you 60 days. So at least. They're off that corner for the summer, so the decent people in those neighborhoods can still walk by. So just another aspect of it as well. Thank you. Good luck to you and me. Anybody else? All right, very well. We are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you very much.